Good morning to everybody. I am Alessandra Venturini. I am the holder of the Jean Monnet Chair on European Migration Studies, hosted by the University of Torino and financed by the European Commission. I'm very glad today to start the um, the fifth seminar of, uh, of the, fifth, uh, the fifth lecture of the seminar consumption of cultural goods as driver of MIGA integration. COCUMINT is the acronym. I'm very honored and glad that Idushir Raj Izara has accepted the invitation. And I leave the floor to my colleague Enrico Bertacchini, who is an economist of culture, to introduce him briefly. Thank you, Enrico. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alessandra. It is, uh, yes, my honor to introduce uh, uh, Professor uh, Izar, Emeritus Professor from the uh, American University in Paris, uh, and uh, he will uh, give a lecture on urban cultural diversity today, the policy challenges. I leave the floor to Professor Izar for uh, introducing the uh, and uh, telling us about how diversity in the urban context uh, is uh, uh, actually today a real challenge. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so how do I share this? Ah, yes, found it. So, um, go from start. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay. Well, to begin with, let me say how glad I am to be with you. Thank you for this information, uh, this invitation. I'm honored. And I have a long-standing connection with uh, the University of Torino, which all started with the late Walter Santagata, with whom um, I had the pleasure of working notably in one of the uh, book series that I, that I co-edited. Um, the topic that I'm going to deal with this afternoon is the one you see, actually. It's not what is in the program and, and, and what you just uh, cited, uh, Enrico. And, and the reason for this is, it's, it's not about urban cultural diversity today, the policy challenges. The reason for this is that most of what I have to say on that subject is already in the reading that was sent to you. That's, that's the reading. So I hope that many of you have read this already or, or, or will. And my thought was, why repeat the same thing? Why not broaden the scope a bit while including some elements from that, that particular set of thoughts? Now, originally, and this is the second preliminary remark that I want to make, I was invited to speak on the subject cultural policy and the diversity of cultural expressions. And it's important to understand that that phrase, the diversity of cultural expressions, is UNESCO language, it's UNESCO code for the production, distribution, and consumption of cultural goods and services. And doing justice to this kind of topic in the context of migration would have required me to have done recent empirical study, both qualitative and quantitative, which um, I simply haven't done. And so, um, for example, the, my work on the cultural and creative industries, and that's when I worked with uh, Professor Santagata, um, and this was when I uh, edited this, this volume, which is all about uh, cultural con production, consumption, and distribution. Well, that was a whole decade ago. I was working around 2011, 2012, 2013. And even there, I wasn't really looking that much for this report, the interface between migrants and the cultural economy. That wasn't the main subject. Um, let me just go on. There, there is another point that I wanted to introduce at the start, which is that um, we, we are sometimes not very clear about what we mean by migrants. Now, here are some people, some of them very famous, and the one who's right on the left here is the writer Amin Malouf, who is uh, Lebanese born, now lives in France, is a member of the uh, August Académie Française. And in a, a recent um, interview with uh, uh, actually a, uh, a journal in um, 
Portugal, he called himself a migrant. And I think uh, the other people here could call themselves migrants. Uh, this uh, lovely woman in the middle is Chantal Shiva Lingappa. She's a dancer and she lives in Paris. This is Homi Bhabha that some of you may have read, a very distinguished and, and difficult to understand cultural scholar. Uh, this is Gayatri Spivak, who is also a cultural scholar in, and leading feminist scholar in America. And this is Asya Jabbar, the late Asya Jabbar, who was also a member of the Académie Française and it was a writer and historian from Algeria. So are we talking about migrants in that sense or are we talking about migrants in the sense that that word already, the concept was already there in ancient Greece with the notion of the mythic, Omi Bhabha, Amin Malouf, Asya Jabbar, they belong to the transnational cultural elite, but they're, they're migrants to be sure. They've moved, uh, but they're not like the people who have moved who, because they are coerced, because they're persecuted, because they've been dispossessed, or simply because they uh, seek to escape from a life of extreme deprivation. And um, you won't be surprised that if I were to say to you that my primary interest is, is in the issues of fairness and the issues of equity that deal with migrants in, in, in this sense. And um, a third preliminary mark I, I want to make this afternoon is that when we talk about culture, we often conflate, we often mix two different understandings of culture. One is the very broad understanding of culture as ways of life. And there's the narrow understanding of culture as the arts and heritage. Um, the first meaning, and if I go back, it's you know, culture as ways of life, involves uh, broad questions of political philosophy, of anthropology, of sociology, while the latter, the topic that you see on this screen, is more a question of arts policy, heritage concerns, and certainly, if you are looking at migrant populations, it is very important to look at what kind of policy a government may have, a city may have, uh, in relation to the expressive lives of these people, the kinds of culture they can uh, express and consume. And I will come to that um, in, in, very shortly. So when we talk about cultural policy, we actually have to straddle both senses. We, we are straddling, on the one hand, the uh, cultural uh, ways of life sense, and we are straddling the uh, narrow arts and heritage sense. So having made those preliminary remarks, I come to the content of what I'm trying to get across to you this afternoon. And it's, it's basically these four points. Um, I'll just give you a second to digest them and dive straight into uh, the first point, which is uh, the, the way one might conceive of the core of the policy challenge. Uh, and that is that time, space, compression, which is in a word, in a one phrase, that's globalization, has led to ever increasing mobilities and flows. And of course, that's where the migrant populations come in. And I've added there for this presentation that, of course, many of these flows are coerced. These flows have created many mixings, interpenetrations, hybridities, and this increasing heterogeneity, this increasing social cultural heterogeneity in societies poses a whole new set of policy challenges. And coming back to the notion of, of diversity and how it, we need to unpack this term, um, and I attended the, the talk that uh, was given by Stephen Bertovec, and he alluded to this also. This slide just shows you how one might look at different kinds of diversities that are policy challenges for our societies uh, today. And what I put in italics, of course, is the theme uh, that concerns us now, which is diasporic and migrant cultures uh, of displaced peoples, which often also involve mobile cultural networks. 
And out of this, these different sets of diversities, different kinds of diversities, we can, I think, speak of a, an imperative, uh, an agenda, and indeed, I am one of those people who has an agenda because I work between academia and policymaking, uh, unlike Stephen Vertovec, who remains uh, purely within the academy, and that's a perfectly honorable stance to have. So when you have an agenda, that first point is how do you recognize and revalue uh, all forms of difference? Yet what we are talking about today is the claims to the recognition of difference or the enjoyment of difference, which are associated with the international movement, movement of peoples. It might have been conquest in, in former centuries or millennia. Today, it's migrants and refugees. And what we realize, of course, is that these claims can challenge and crack open the basic grammar of national cultures, and they often rub up against all kinds of her her issues heritage for her inherited from the past, which have to do with racism and colonialism. Um, th this is just a slide I wanted to share with you just to recapitulate, and you'll find this also in the text uh, that has been distributed, um, the existence of diversity in all of these forms has a set of benefits, we believe. Uh, there are also uh, negative dimensions related, uh, obviously, to the potential for conflict. But here I am underlining these uh, seven points, which for me uh, express why uh, the encouragement, the, the fostering of uh, cultural diversity in both senses is a good thing. And I come, of course, to the, the negative side. And um, this slide on the anxieties um, could be articulated, as you see, that um, it all starts with uncertainty about how we are, who they are, the, 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 the uncertainty about in-groups, about us and them. And that uncertainty also creates anxieties about access to goods and services that are provided by the state, welfare services, housing, healthcare, that is often tied to who we and they are. And as you well know, um, certainly across European societies, much of the negative talk about migrants is that they are taking our benefits away. They are getting benefits that, that we don't get, that they get. And uh, these anxieties uh, are, uh, uh, get attached uh, increasingly to migratory flows, to these large-scale movements uh, of people where they, they get attached to ethnic identities. And when existing networks of social knowledge are eroded or, or tampered with by rumor, by terror, or by social movements, and some of you may already know this, this, this notion of moral panic. Um, we see that a moral panic is when there is a thought that runs through society about some danger that is posed by a particular group. And we know very well that there is a lot of moral panic about, in many countries today, about immigrants. Put in another way, this is, this is a little bit more abstract, uh, you could say that what's happening here is a mixture of fear of what the other might do to you, rage at what you believe that the other has already done to you, and incomprehension of who the other actually is. And I'll go on to come back to how that imperative of diversity poses uh, two challenges that are key, as I see them, is how does uh, the policy in a society reconcile difference and commonality? And this is particularly difficult today in, in societies which have so far represented themselves as being homogeneous. That's not really the case in Europe because most European societies do recognize that they are shot through already and have been for many centuries with uh, difference, but in uh, varying degrees. And how do we as a civic community 
uh, as a nation, uh, how do we envisage ourselves as a civic community? How do, how do we look at ourselves, whether it's an ethnic group, whether it's our town, whether it's our nation, and there, it, these things are layered, of course. How do we come to civic community? What I want to turn to now is how you might look at different policy stances that have existed, that, that actually exist today. And I look at these stances and um, see in what way none of them really can work and what that suggests for future policy or for ongoing policy. So the, the four stances that can be identified are, are these, assimilationist, the second one is proceduralist, the third one is civic assimilationist, and the fourth is the millet model. The word millet comes from uh, a usage in the uh, Ottoman Empire. So assimilationist, that's a stance that really is not something that seems possible at all today. It ignores diversity in its imperatives. It's based on the conviction that any stable political community has to have a homogenous national culture. And if you like, uh, a model that has now disappeared, which is the American melting pot model, actually was the representation of that. And of course, now nobody in America really believes in the uh, melting pot anymore. And in the um, mid 80s, uh, an American historian called Francis Fitzgerald coined the notion of the salad bowl, which is now widely used. Americans do see themselves as a mosaic of different cultures and as a salad bowl. So this assimilist, assimilationist position, we can sort of sweep it aside because it isn't, it isn't really at all in vogue anymore. It isn't practiced. Then you have the three remaining stances, and I call these integrative because they're ways in which uh, policymakers are trying to solve the, the, the problem. And um, none of these, as we should see, can really do the job in a fully satisfactory way. So let me start with the proceduralist. And this is the position that the state should set out only minimal rules about cultural differences, since these are really incommensurable. They, they can't ever be, be, be overrun or overcome. And they really are beyond the scope of uh, public action. What the state needs to do is simply to be neutral and it must ignore cultural differences. And um, the theory is that, well, since the state doesn't impose in any way on individual choice, it in fact, by this very option, is facilitating cultural diversity. But in reality, is it ever possible to reach consensus on common values? That's the question you have to ask about the stance. The state can't help but make value choices. It's, it's illusory to think that the state can, can remain value neutral. And if you think about the kind of language that in your own country's policymakers, or government officials uh, use, um, even cultural leaders, uh, thought leaders use, um, it's, it's very clear that there is, is no real uh, moral uh, or value neutrality that's being practiced. The uh, next position that I want to take up is the idea that the political community must have a shared culture, but that this does not have to pervade all spheres of life. What counts is what's in the public sphere. People in the private sphere within their own homes are free to make their own choices. So public sphere, you've got to be uniform. You've got to avoid all signs, all symbols that set you apart. Private sphere, you can be as diverse as possible. And the unity of the society is determined in and by the public sphere, which defines limits of allowable diversity while around allowing full diversity in the private sphere. And of course, the classic case of that is my own country's France, which um, has a very, very strict uh, division, not just the 
the politicians, but also society between, uh, and, and I won't rehearse all of the issues that have been uh, raised in this connection in Fl France recently, uh, you are probably very aware of them. And I've also, in a way, anticipated uh, in my remarks the, the content of this side. Is it always so easy to distinguish between the pu public and the private realms? And any political culture is the product of a, of a history, so it's not something that is static. It can evolve considerably in terms of values, symbols, public rituals, etc. Um, I could quote here a famous statement that was made by many years ago by a former British uh, foreign minister, for, British foreign secretary, who when asked what is the national food of uh, Great Britain, said it was chicken tikka masala. And uh, that was, uh, and if you look at the, the nature of British cultural life today, it's very clear that this is what is happening. And the British cultural life is, of course, not a monocultural public sphere because a monocultural public sphere would inevitably hamper the expression of difference, even in the private sphere, because it necessarily exerts an assimilating force. Uh, I'll go on to the, and, 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 and we could sort of provide examples. Uh, another example before I continue of, the, of this kind of situation is one that um, the sociologist Ulrich Beck has written about, others as well, the typical situation is when you have two generations and in a public space, the parents are speaking in their own language, their own native language, and the children are very concerned about that. They don't want the parents to speak in that language. They want the parents to speak in the language of the country, in French, in Italian, in English. And that's the, 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 that's the, the message there. And finally, the millet model is something that comes from the, the practice of the uh, Ottoman Empire, which very clearly recognized that the Ottoman Empire had a religion, which was obviously Islam, but that um, the Islamic state, as it were, had no position as regard, regards its Jewish subjects or its Christian subjects. It's uh, the people who came under the empire, whether they were in, 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 in South, uh, Southwest Europe or wherever they were. And the idea here is that, the, that, the, that there is autonomy, that, that uh, cultural communities are autonomous, and the role of the state is to protect their economy. Of course, this worked in the Ottoman Empire, where really no public sphere in the contemporary sense actually existed, and where non-Muslims were essentially second-class citizens. And if you applied it today, it would freeze all forms of belonging in ways that we no longer believe appropriate. It would also exclude multiple belonging. But what, what would you do if, if people thought that of themselves as having hyphenated uh, identities, as many of us actually do? So it's not really something that's viable in a culturally globalized world. I come now to um, the third part of what I wanted to share with you today, and that is, if you are looking at policies for dealing with cultural difference and cultural diversity, um, what are the contexts in which those policies and governmental measures would actually play out? And um, I see four contexts, the civic, the administrative, the social, uh, and the economic. And of course, let me just start with the economic because that's uh, at the heart of, uh, of this course, how do different cultural co communities, how can they access infrastructure and resources for the production of uh, cultural goods and services? But with the first one is the, the civic context, is the kinds of cultural rights and entitlements that are awarded to, to people belonging to different cultural streams. How free are they in relation to the public sphere issues that we've looked at to be themselves, to put it in very simple ways. Um, the administrative context ha actually have to do with what are the tools that a city or a country will give so as to provide agency 
to those uh, immigrant populations themselves, those different populations. And the social refers to how you link up the social objectives and cultural planning objectives. And very often you find the word social cohesion is central here. Uh, a lot of policymakers believe that cultural giving cultural access and opportunities to different populations is very good for building social cohesion. I don't know if that's actually the case, but that's another subject. And it was something, if I remember well, that Stephen Vertebeck referred to also. There are five policy domains that, that one could uh, identify. Um, I lost the numbering here, so these will be just these kinds of bullet points rather than numbers. The first is, um, how do you create institutions that allow uh, vehicles that are in fact vehicles for cultural expression and debate in, uh, in a society? Just, just to give you an example, I was for many years on the board of something called the Institute of Visual Arts, which was set up by the Arts Council of Great Britain at the time and the London Greater Arts Council. And it was designed to promote the expression of people who had not been born in, in the UK, who were essentially immigrants to the UK or had diff different cultural identities from British identity, uh, as it was then conceived, uh, and give them an opportunity for their work to be seen, shown, appreciated. Um, now, this kind of organization, which by the 90s seemed normal in the UK, it would be impossible to have that in France, because in public policy in France, this would be seen as promoting communautarism. That would be, by definition, a bad thing. So the second, the second area is uh, policies that are attuned to particular kinds of social dynamics. Uh, what happens when uh, a generation of uh, people who uh, are the children of migrants, uh, and so they use this stupid term, second generation migrants, they're, they're not second generation migrants at all. They're, they're people born to, migrants of the first generation. But when there is some kind of sense that they, they don't want to be different, but then that changes with, with, with the increasing acceptance of diversity in societies, children of migrants are now beginning to say, yes, we want our, our, our identities of origin to be, to be recognized. Uh, to take again a, a French example, uh, uh, the Musée du Quai Branly, the, the, the Museum of World Cultures, um, is now something that immigrants uh, who are in their teens and young adults are very happy to visit because it is a representation of something that they have, their parents left behind, but something that they feel is part of them, that, those kinds of cultural expression. And then the, the, the three other uh, policy domains uh, are, the first one is obviously uh, very related to the production uh, and distribution of cultural goods and services. The cultural and creative industries is, is at the heart of that. Uh, then you have um, the, the whole question of, of everyday, everyday life, um, how there is this interconnection between artistic and media preferences in everyday life. And that's where issues of inter intellectual property come in. Uh, and then the last point there that it's always important in this kind of socio-cultural policy to have mechanisms of assessment and evaluation that are both uh, quantitative and qualitative, because at some point you need to be able to, to measure and um, consider the impact of your policies. And just to kind of sum up the direction, as it were, in which I've been going, uh, through this presentation, let me just now share with you what could be seen as four key principles. The first is uh, participation. I didn't use the word participation, but uh, it's one that, that could be used there. Um, and this goes back to, you could even say, Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
because that's what Article 27 of the Universal Declaration actually is about. It's about people being able to um, enjoy uh, the, the, the capacities to take part in cultural life. Um, the, the, the second point is, the second principle is that um, this should happen in ways that doesn't necessarily require to people, people to change their cultural affiliations. If they choose to do so, that's fine. Um, and of course, you'll get the paradox that in many of their cultures of origin, um, that would be frowned about. The cultures of origin would say, you can only be us if you don't have anything to do with the cultures of them. And of course, that again is a position that is no longer valid in a world where interculturality, transculturality, and I will come to that in a moment, with a couple of uh, slides. In that kind of world, this isn't really possible anymore. The third key principle is that it's important to nurture the sources of cultural diversity, and that really comes out of uh, the second key principle um, of, of self-expression, uh, because those are the sources of cultural diversity. And the last one is the capacity to promote through policy ongoing interactions so that cultural identities are being formed, reformed in ways that will favor a continuing dynamic for diversity. So any society which begins to see itself and recognizes that much of what is its contemporary culture is the product of hybridity and fusion, and of course the most obvious example and the easiest one is in food, the fusion, the concept of fusion food, but you need to go much beyond just the realm uh, of, of food in order to have a policy stance here. Um, there are critiques of these kinds of policy approaches, which are uh, often referred to as multiculturalism, but there's more to them than strict multiculturalism. And the four, uh, the four, I think there are four critiques. I get if I have three or four, but we'll, we'll see in a minute. The first is that, that you're aesthet aestheticizing, you're depoliticizing what is basic economic or social inequality through a kind of cosmetic celebration of cultural diversity. The second critique is that you are actually reifying and essentializing differences uh, at the expense of their mixing and intermingling. Um, I won't go into explaining what reification is. I might come back to that if there's a question or essentialization is. Essentialization I can explain. It's, it's reducing somebody to being just one thing. I am Indian, therefore I must think in a, way, a certain way, dress in a certain way, uh, eat in a certain way. Um, that's not how people are anymore. And the, 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 the remaining two uh, critiques, the third one really uh, comes out of the, the previous one, is that multiculturalism manages relations between cultures being separate rather than promoting Convivencia, which is the, the Spanish term, impossible to translate exactly. Conviviality is not quite the same. But when, a, when somebody who's Spanish speaking speaks of convivencia, it's living together with difference. And um, the third, uh, the final critique is that uh, multiculturalist policy, as it's actually practiced, doesn't promote that ongoing dynamic that I referred to a few slides ago, that what you need is to promote the continuous production of diversity in society. I said I would look at um, intercultural approaches, which um, are very important in the context of how societies relate to their immigrants. And in the public realm, I think it's important to define these four areas um, in the text that was distributed to you, um, I did speak a little bit about uh, museums and, and public heritage institutions, so, so do read that. But these, these points are, are, I think, relatively simple, so I'm not going to repeat them. 
just give you uh, a few seconds more to uh, digest them. And if you have any questions, of course, um, come, we'll come back to that uh, at, the, at the end and during the question and answer. Um, the, 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 the last point, which is the whole notion of affirmative action, um, is one, again, that um, in my own current society, France, uh, would be very, very difficult to practice in policy, at least avowedly so. But in reality, a lot of mayors, a lot of uh, local officials in France are actually doing this. So uh, the, the intercultural plays out in the public realm in, in that way. And in the, uh, uh, I think I forgot the private realm, but it, the private realm is not really necessary. Uh, what I come to now, and this is the sort of closing bit of um, my presentation, uh, and that is uh, to look at the work of uh, two uh, British uh, thinkers, one of whom is was born in Italy, Franco Bianchini, who's from Bologna, uh, who have worked a lot about around this idea of the intercultural city. And um, what they're talking about is how you actually develop moral sympathies among people with different cultures. And that cultural renewal in a contemporary city really depends on mixes that can challenge the reigning paradigms of dominance, exclusion, and inclusion. And those paradigms are often not really cultural. They're, act, they're economic, they're social, they're political. So here are the two key rationales that thinkers like, like uh, Bloomfield and Bianchini would advocate. And continuing a little bit to look at some of their recommendations, um, what they're saying is that we're in a, 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 a cultural condition in our time where boundaries are in a per permanent state of flux and remaking. So promote communication across these boundaries between majority and minority, between dominant and sub, among localities, among classes, among faiths and genres. And that there is a real need in terms of social and cultural creativity to create, set up initiatives that enable different cultures to intersect, to contaminate each other, to hybridize. And so that uh, takes us to um, uh, I think what is the final uh, slide on the work of the Intercultural City Group is that what you're talking about is that you're reshaping the public sphere as a space of diversity rather than some kind of pre-existing hole into which people are integrated. Uh, and this is something that for many years I've heard from leading thinkers of, uh, among immigrants or scholars who, who come from uh, immigrant backgrounds. They're saying, we, we, don't, we don't want to be integrated into the mainstream. We are part of the mainstream. And that's not always easy to, to, to do and to get recognized. And it will often involve difficult public debate. It'll involve frictions, confrontations, and when you have frictions and confrontations, of course, in social and cultural life, you need mediations. And I'm going to uh, conclude um, with um, a video that comes from the experience of the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. Uh, I actually now work as a almost a full-time consultant with the Trust for Culture, the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, um, developing an educational program. And what I'm doing here is not is not part of that. So I'm not promoting the work of the Aga Khan Trust for Culture at all. But when I was preparing this this presentation, which is clearly based on a set of ideas that has been in my mind for a number of years. I said it would be wonderful to be able to relate the policy recommendations that I'm sharing with the students today with something that I'm doing now. And um, architecture is one of those arts which shapes 
the public sphere, the, it shapes public space literally. And there's a very close interconnection between architecture, planning, urbanism, and uh, cultural identity. And it just so happens that there is a, re <clears throat> a project, a, an architectural project that was created, designed in Denmark, in and for a part of the city of Copenhagen in which mostly immigrant populations live that was awarded the Aga Khan Award for Architecture in 2016. Every three years, the Aga Khan Award for Architecture recognizes projects of various kinds that don't just embody architectural excellence, design excellence, aesthetic excellence, but embody social impact, interaction with issues of our time, with political issues, with sustainability issues, with urban planning issues, with image issues in the widest sense. So here uh, is this brief um, video in which uh, you'll learn more about the Super Kielen project in Copenhagen. And if any of you want more information, I do have the citation that the jury actually wrote when this project was recognized. So I'm clicking on the link, and this should take us to the page of the website of the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, which describes the, um, the project. And um, I think we may have time for me to um, just read the, a public space promoting integration across lines of ethnicity, religion, and culture. A meeting place for residents of Denmark's most ethnically diverse neighborhood and an attraction for the rest of the city, this project was approached as a giant exhibition of global urban good practice. So, and I'll just jump. Rather than a public outreach process geared towards the lowest common denominator or a politically correct post-rationalization of preconceived ideas constructed around any potential public space, the architects proposed public participation as the driving force of the design, an extensive public consultation process garnered suggestions for objects representing the over 60 nationalities present locally to be placed in the area. The 750 meter long scheme comprises three main zones. And I won't go into the main zones. I'll show you the film right away. This area is one of the areas in, in Copenhagen with the highest crime rate, or maybe even in entire Denmark. It felt very unsecure. To make the Nerebro neighborhood safer, the City Hall of Copenhagen decided to create a big public park. Architect Nana Gilto Muller and artist Rasmus Nielsen were in charge of the project. In our very first walk through the area, we could see that there was a big diversity in the people living in the neighborhood. We, we found that it was around 60 different nations living in the area. And rather than seeing the diversity as a problem, we wanted to see it as a resource. So basically that in the park there would be elements from as many countries of the people living here uh, through objects and stories. The golden one is a playground from India. And the the elephant slide is from Chernobyl, and um, the red benches over there are kind of a double bench from Switzerland. And also one of our favorites is the, the Moroccan fountain, where parents often sit and meet and talk while the kids are playing. The ideas of the park was to make use of dreams 
that could kind of materialize into things. We divided the area in like three parts. Yeah, all three areas, they are very different. The red square is uh, mainly for skaters. There's the black square is more classical square where the locals are hanging out and kids are playing. And then the green park is more uh, for exercise and uh, more bigger sports activities. It's, it's pretty easy to see today that all these different activities, they make people meet. For me, that's one of the, the greatest things to see that people actually meet in the area. We wanted to create a public space where people from a very diverse sort of background would sort of feel at home. Our motto, yes, is more. It's, uh, it's very much about not saying no to things, saying yes. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, your presentation was fascinating for me that dealing with migration all the time, it was exactly of the point. But I still have uh, a big problem with diversity because, as you know, Denmark, even if uh, they have organized this fantastic place, uh, is apply a very is under attack because they are, the the Danish government is applying a very restrictive policy for asylum seeker. They send the student uh, from Syria back because, according to them, Syria is a peaceful place. Uh, they also try. So it's very difficult to accept diversity. And I'm always fascinated by Jacobs. You remember the famous work of Jacobs in New York after the Second yeah. World War? Yeah, Jacobs, yeah. Ja yeah. yeah. Jacob was, uh, New York was a laboratory. Yes. All the people arrived with their own mm -hmm. background, mm -hmm. and the city was a place for innovation. No? So yes. the atmosphere counts so much. The atmosphere is done by the history and mm -hmm. by the culture. And that reason why studying integration of MIGA, integration, assimilation, the wording mm -hmm. that is, uh, there, there are so many words used now in social science for saying this, um, I end up with culture. Because in the past, I always was thinking that first you have economic integration, and after you have cultural integration. Now I'm revising completely my vision of the sequence. I think it is much more important the cultural integration to enhance economic integration. Because if people don't understand the culture of the others, they don't understand the expression of the majority, because fundamentally migrants are a minority, they put themselves in a corner solution, in a ghetto, in an enclave. And uh, uh, the majority is enabled to. So I think that uh, the, um, the integration policy should stress much more the cultural aspect than uh, only the economic one. That's, let us say, to be integrated in the labor market, you need hard skill and soft skill. The hard skill are easy to teach. You teach somebody the work they have to do, but you don't teach them how you should interpret the action of the other, the behavior of the other. And this is very difficult to teach. So it's something that you have to experience. And you made the example of shared existence solidarity. You, may, you make an example in which you think they have to do something together. In this way, and from my point of view, the consumption of cultural good enhance much more rapidly than anything else the cultural assimilation, which allows the, the foreigner to enter also in the labor market much easily because they know how to behave. They know they are they receive an interpretation of what is happening in the country of destination. These things are very difficult to teach. You're absolutely right. They're very difficult to teach. You, you need emotion. Yeah. You, and culture yeah. is emotion. And that's yeah. reason why 
I think that is very important to revise the priority first uh, economic integration, then cultural integration, because in this way you leave migrant in a in a corner solution, in a ghetto solution, because you slow down the understanding of the culture of the destination country. So they don't learn the soft skill, how to communicate, how to interpret the action of the other. And I am very much interested in, um, in considering culture an instrument to integration, integrate the majority of the minority, everybody, to create space and equal opportunity for well-being which is at the end assimilation is equal opportunity for well-being. Fully agree. I mean, everything that I was saying about uh, the kinds of stances or measures dealt with both sides, not just one side. So it's not a question of, of host societies, as it were, to use that term, having to do all the work. It, the, the, the work needs to be done on, on both sides. I'm not so sure that the... Um, Putting the cultural so much to the fore is, is a good thing. If you look at the, um, it's a different situation in the United States, but if you look at, let's say, American Blacks, nobody in the United States among the ma majority white community contests the cultural excellence of Black musicians and Black artists. But that doesn't remove discrimination against black who, Blacks who aren't musicians and artists. So. It's, 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 it's not simply a question of recognizing uh, the cult different cultural values. There, ha there has to be a, an almost equal uh, economic dimension. Uh, but where I do um, uh, agree with you is that um, it's very important to find ways in which to uh, teach uh, the, the values of both sides and to start I think it's very important to start very early on. There are several slides that I didn't show that are right at the end of my presentation. And those are slides that are based on work that I did in 2002 for the European Commission, for the Prodi Commission, actually. Yes. And it was a, a commission, the, 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 the commission created a group of experts to look at dialogue between uh, both sides of the Mediterranean. And mm -hmm. there, were, there was a group of high-level experts who came together. And one of those experts was Umberto Eco. And Umberto Eco said to us, and I was on the secretariat of this group, he said, you know, all of this is, is, is great to, to have all of these thoughts, but if we don't start young, if we don't start with the kids, with the immigrant children and the children of our uh, mainstream societies, our existing societies, we are not going to realize any of these noble aims. It'll just remain in the realm of ideas. And so it is an educational process right from the start. Yes, education, but not the traditional education. Yes. I would say it's the cultural education. Absolutely. Yes. Enrico, I know. Yes, I have a um, no, very interesting and uh, I, I want to touch just uh, um, a, a question or a comment uh, uh, that is possibly connected also to some discussion that we had in previous lectures of the series. Uh, at one point, you mentioned that uh, dealing with cultural diversity, uh, it's, uh, there is a, a, some kind of tension between the public sphere and the private sphere or uh, there can be also a kind of coexistence of cultural expressions or um, in the public mm -hmm. sphere and in the private sphere. And the example that you showed, for example, in Copenhagen is, uh, is actually an intervention in the public sphere to, to, to favor the, the, the cultural dialogue between different uh, cultures. Uh, but do you think that today we digital technologies, the, the, the increasing use of, of uh, content and uh, uh, interactions uh, and experiences that can be done on uh, online uh, compared to the to the physical and public space of the place where we live and and people live 
there there is a kind of a shift uh, or in the balance between the public and private spheres uh, and this may may somehow uh, change the perspective of uh, cultural policies or integration policies that want to affect, for example, interventions in the public spheres to favor the dialogue uh, between cultures and uh, and communities. This is uh, just a, a question of or if you have some views on this uh, from your experience. C certainly, uh, the, the only thing I'd say is that the, that the the digital realm, the digital environment is, 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 is rightly now the public sphere and there are issues of access and accessibility there too. So um, it's as if um, uh, in, the, in the digital, it's not that easy for all voices to be heard. And so the challenge is to be able to get all voices heard. It's much easier now for uh, very small voices or limited voices to find expression. Um, and so that's another level at which uh, this can progress. I think the uh, human societies, particularly urban societies, really now need uh, to occupy public space. So the public space remains very important, but you're absolutely right. There is a different set of issues in the digital space, yeah. to be sure. I don't know if internet is a public space. It's a confused space, first of all. Confused because you receive message uh, news uh, which are not selected. From all the side you, you, you have... Uh, I don't know if it is public space because you stay alone. Or you don't really um, have contact with the real person, but only what the the internet is bringing to you. Uh, well, my, if, if I can add one thing to a comment uh, for the discussion, my point was that at least uh, internet can give opportunity to, to everybody to construct uh, its own, his or her own public space uh, of communication and interaction. And possibly when we deal about uh policies uh, that try to favor in the public sphere the, the dialogue uh, uh but based on uh, some geographical proximity of the people living in the same place uh, this can cre create some some well change completely the the also possibly the outcomes of interventions because uh, People oh, can escape from the physical public sphere where they live and move on uh, on uh, on their own private public or privately public spheres created online. This was just a. Uh, you know, I, I think then there maybe look at it a little differently. The, the the original the original sort of public sphere was defined as the coffee house, let's say, in, in European societies. And not everybody went into the coffee house. There was a kind of process already of selection of who went into the coffee house, who was able to meet in the coffee house. But that was the the origin. So there have always been this, the public the public sphere has always been segmented. Uh, when when you talk about public space, that's different. That actually has to be a physical space. But the public sphere can be multiple. And um, I, I couldn't give you necessarily a really. I mean, there, there are lots of positive examples, but a very negative example of how a public sphere is being constructed is all of the extreme right-wing groups that discussed the attack on the Capitol before and after. And the people, those people communicating among themselves are actually communicating in a public sphere. They're communicating with each other, but in a segmented Yes, in the gate. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It, it's become pro affiliation. If you are yes. affiliated with the group, you are in yes. a subset of public sphere. So mm -hmm. I think that with the internet, you replicate the same thing. Yes. Uh, yeah. With lower cost of clan, clubs, uh, oh. and so on. The communities yes. of interest, communities of allegiance. Those, those exist in, in so many different ways in, in, all, in all societies. Yeah. Yes. 
it will be even more difficult for us because the new generation is so used to this type of exchange in this internet that is difficult for them, especially now with the coronavirus around, not going to school and so on, to have real exchange. And uh, they can have partial vision mm -hmm. dominating the perception of the world uh, which is even more difficult to manage, I think. You're absolutely and, right. Yes, I think that a lot has been done during this period to open museum to internet. So to, you can stay in your house and visit a museum. And this type of thing has been very important, that there has been many steps um, to open uh, the heritage, the, the museum, the art gallery, and so on, to people that before were not even entering. Sure, that, and that you're absolutely right. And that's where, uh, again, those museums that have collections that are from the representative of, of diverse cultural streams, uh, and again, you know, I don't know what kind of programming the Musée du Quai Branly is, is, is doing at the moment online, but all of its collections being diverse, uh, that's all it has to, to, to present online. Yes. And it will be having the same effect on the, the people who belong to, who, who are descended from those cultural streams who live, whether they live in France or abroad. And so that message will go broader than France once it's, exactly. on, uh, once it's on the internet. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Also the concert uh, that has been played on TV. So I think it's very important this dimension because it's without any cost, with, mm -hmm. you don't need a lot of time. So it's a way of diffusing culture. Yes. Uh, also for two people that before were in, Mm -hmm. in well constrained by time and money and this is very important correct um, i don't know if andrea ricci has a question uh yes i have <laughs> <laughs> Please don't um yeah thank you so much for your presentation and um what i what i see in your presentation is uh for me clear understanding of what of what integration in some sense could 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 relate to uh, from a part to space physical space abstract space such as community or uh, uh, physical space such as places squares and so on mm -hmm. in the video show us uh, this dimension and the second uh, field is actions actions did by uh, people, natives, both natives or migrants, uh, local institution and so on. A and this makes me uh, think about um, that there is a strong relation between the two, these two dimensions, between actions and spaces. And my question is, um, in your opinion, which role uh, local communities have in forge in some way uh, cultural identity or mixing cultural identities, and um, in your even always in your opinion, which is the um, the, the 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 success European societies have uh, in some way uh, rich in these in these years. I'm not sure I understand the first question, but on the second question, I I really haven't followed this this on the ground. As I said, I I'm. Uh, in the last years, you'd be thinking of, let's say, what happened in 2020, what's happening in 2021, and we're not getting out, and I'm not, you know, I'm not following, so I, I really don't know. My hunch is that um, a lot is going on, we, as I said earlier about France, a lot more is being done by city authorities in France than the central government and, and uh, politicians at the central level uh, are, uh, are even interested in. So my, my, my feeling is that, yes, there is a lot, but again, it's a feeling. It's not, a, it's not empirically based on any observation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yudisha, thank you very much. The conference was absolutely very interesting, very challenging, 
we continue discussing this with the next uh, two meeting. I don't know if you know Marco Martiniello with uh, Sieber. They are in the Imiscoe section uh, in the board of DivCult, which is diversity and culture, and uh, they still work on this field. So the discussion will continue. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we are honored that you participate with us.